first though, to recap, we explain the five second rule for us. Yes, real quick, it's super simple. It's gonna sound kind of stupid. You can use it immediately once you hear it. The moment you have an instinct to act on a goal or you know you should do something but you feel yourself hesitate, just count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. That'll switch the gears in your mind. It'll activate your prefrontal cortex. Boom, when you hit one, go. There's a five second window between your instincts that change your life and your mind killing them. So it's critical that you learn how to wake up and take control in that moment. And, and you know, the five second rule is going to help you do that as a tool for change and for making powerful decisions. So you say that our brains are built to protect us yes. uh, from change and the scary things in life. Yes. Uh, but to, to hone on the point that these are our brains. So what, what does our body do in those instances when, when the, we're faced with those scary things in life? Well, so one of my favorite uses of the five second rule is to use it for mind control. And I say that with a complete <laughs> straight face. Right. Not okay. Um, so I used to be someone that suffered from tremendous anxiety. I took Zoloft for 20 years after panic attacks started in law school. And Zoloft was a wonderful drug for me to take. I, I kind of thought about anxiety a lot like, all right, if I were diabetic, I would take insulin. There's no shame in mental health. We've all got something going on. Take the drugs, stabilize your body, and get on with your life. And about four years ago, I started to wonder, and you know, this is a personal story. Um, I started to wonder, could I use the five second rule to actually control my thoughts. Could I use it to cure myself of anxiety? Now the answer is yes you can and yes you should. But the reason why I was inspired to do this is because like so many of you, I have kids. Two of our three kids struggle with anxiety. Um, we have a 17, a 16, and an 11 year old. And for our 16 and our 11 year old, right around the time they were 10, mm -hmm. they both had these really acute moments of anxiety where they could no longer do sleepovers. They um, were limiting what they were doing. I mean, it's so sad when you see a little kid starting to edit their experiences in life because of their thoughts. Right. And so I thought about four years ago, okay, if I really wanna help my kids deal with anxiety, maybe it's time for me, Mel Robbins, to come off of Zoloft and try this five second rule and learn everything that I can about uh, neuroscience and anxiety and how it works and what it is and what it isn't and the connection between the feelings in your body right. and what your brain does so that I can help my kids, right? Because it's one, you know, it's not really fair if mom's on Zoloft going, oh, you know, change your thoughts. Right. But if I teach myself how to deal with the worries and the, the panic and the anxiety that I used to struggle with, maybe I could help them. So here's what I did. Um, first, you have to understand what anxiety is and you have to understand the connection between worry, which is something we all do, and self-doubt, which is something we all do, and anxiety. So we all have a habit of worrying. And just for the sake of this conversation, habits are behaviors that you repeat when you're not paying attention. So believe it or not, it's not just nail biting or tapping a pencil. A habit is even when you back up your car in the morning, if you look over your right shoulder, that's a habit. Mm -hmm. It's behavior that's been automated in your brain. And worrying is a habit. Worrying is a pattern of thinking that you default to when you're not paying attention. When you're not paying attention, you're sitting in a meeting, it's very easy. Have you ever noticed how your thoughts just drift and you start thinking about, oh my gosh, is, is you know, my loved one okay? Oh, you know, I, I, I wonder if I'm in trouble. Like you start immediately thinking and worrying and we just kind of default there. And so the connection between worry and anxiety is uh, close cousins. Anxiety is what happens when your habit of worrying spirals out of control. Your habit, it's just like drinking. You might start drinking casually and if you don't get that habit in check, it can spiral out of control into an addiction. So what happens when you are anxious is that you not only start to worry, but your body starts to feel really anxious too. Your heart will race, your, you might start sweating, your throat can get dry, you can get a pit in your stomach. And 
when you when you start to feel the physical sensations of worry and anxiety and then you got your mind drifting over to something's going wrong right. that is when you can start to really deal with anxiety and if you have anxiety you're not alone they, they say that 30 percent of women um, suffer from anxiety at some point in their lives i will tell you i have been really startled by the number of men that come up to me at the end of speeches that i give as i'm on the corporate circuit giving you know keynotes that come up and say, do you have any more information about anxiety? Do you have any more information about anxiety? And nine times out of 10, it's for them. And I think with all the rapid change in the world and technology and how much you know, in everybody's jobs, things are innovating, there is a, a rise in this habit of worrying, the sense of a loss of control and feeling anxious is very normal. So you know, we talked a little bit about, I believe that you can control your mind it's important for you to foundationally understand that anxiety and worry are the same thing. It's just that your body starts to get agitated and that's when we call worrying anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you can actually beat it. Now the key is stabilizing your thoughts. And you can use the five second rule to do that. One other thing I want to explain to you, and this is something that I was just on with Dr. Oz uh, on his uh, syndicated talk show talking about, is this exact conversation. How do you use the five second rule to cure your anxiety, to control your emotions, to stop yourself from melting down. And here's, how, here's something that you need to understand. First of all, when it comes to your body, in your body, um, there's no difference in your body between feeling excited and feeling anxious. No difference whatsoever. So what do you feel when you're excited about something? You're gonna go to, like, who's, your, like, who's somebody you would love to see in concert? Um, Sting. Okay, oh, Sting. So Sting is playing. You've got incredible tickets. You are standing right there at the stage. The music's starting. He's about to come on. What are you feeling in your body? Those butterflies that kind of, the, the literal kind of flutter inside. Yes, exactly. And that we call excitement because you're there. You're going to see Sting. This is going to be amazing. Now, when you're worried about something or you're anxious about something, maybe you have to speak up. Maybe you have to give a speech. Maybe you have a tough conversation that you've got to have about uh, the IEP for your kid and the, the advocacy that they need. Maybe you got to talk about your, you know, getting a raise. Maybe, maybe you've launched a new business and, and you really want to share it with your friend. Right before you're about to do that thing that you've never done, that you feel a little uncertain or a little insecure about, right? What does your body feel like? Exact same thing, right? Yeah. You got the butterflies. Right. You might start sweating a little bit. Your heart might race. Now, the only difference between Shelby being at the Sting concert and you standing outside the meeting at your kid's school going in to talk about IEPs and you know getting help for your kid, which was something that made me very nervous, the only difference between those two scenarios, because our bodies are doing the same thing, is that Shelby's brain is saying, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Sting is about to come. Oh my gosh. She's not saying, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm at a concert and <gasps> oh, something must be wrong because I feel butterflies. And she's like, Sting's about to come, yes! <laughs> right? Yeah. Your brain is telling you, your brain right. has context. In this situation over here, you see a friend. You, you have this new business you've launched. You really want to share this idea with your friend. But you got butterflies in your stomach. Your brain says something different than what Shelby's brain is saying. It's going, uh-oh, you, you know, she might think you're pushy. Maybe you shouldn't talk to her. You know, this is, this is not a good idea. You're not fully trained yet in this stuff. Or, you know, you're not ready to have this conversation. Who do you think you are to have this conversation? Or, you know, did they, they, I, no. Your mind starts to get worried mm -hmm. and basically says a bunch of negative garbage. Your body, by the way, excitement, fear, same thing. Excitement, anxiety, same thing. Excitement, uncertainty, same thing. Excitement, fear, exact same thing in your body. She's not afraid of stinging coming on stage, but her body is, fe is having all the same signals as if you were afraid of him, mm -hmm. seriously. So the only difference between excitement, fear, anxiety, worry, uncertainty, and stress is what your brain says it is. We can use that to our advantage to cure anxiety and to cure the habits of self-doubt. Here's how you're gonna do it. You're gonna use the five second rule to trick your mind into thinking that you're excited mm -hmm. instead of thinking thoughts that actually expand the nerves, the anxiousness, all that stuff. So you use the five second rule in combination with what we call an anchor thought. 
An anchor thought is a thought that makes you excited. It's a thought that makes you happy. It's a thought that will help you stabilize your brain. Because Shelby could have easily, at the Sting concert, taken the butterflies in her stomach and started catastrophizing. Right. Sting's not coming. I'm going to get trampled. Right. I feel claustrophobic. Oh my God. Like you could have done that, but she didn't because her brain had something else that it was willing to anchor on to ground her, right? And excitement. So what you're going to do, let's just take the scenario of you have a meeting that's making you really anxious. You have a presentation you're going to have to give. You have something that's important to you and you're worried you're not going to be able to make this sale happen or make the IEP happen or whatever it may be. Um, Outside the meeting, the moment you feel yourself starting to worry, the butterflies are kicking in, you're starting to go Niagara Falls down <laughs> under your armpits, five, four, three, two, one. Now, why would you want to count? The reason why you want to count is because, remember, thinking patterns can be habits. And so when you get into the habit of doubting yourself and worrying, you're now in the interior part of your brain, and that can easily take over and expand and escalate the situation. So you want to cut that off and you want to stabilize what's happening by activating your free prefrontal cortex. You're going to go five, four, three, two, one. That's going to activate this puppy up here. Now that your mind is, is awakened in terms of the, the frontal lobe being awakened, you're ready to accept a new thought. You can't just stand there outside your, I've tried this. I've had psychologists for years tell me, oh, just change the channel. Right. Your brain right. is like a TV, just change the channel. No, it's not. My brain is more like a freight train that is, is, is moving at an agitated state of 65 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And if I try to just switch the thought, I'm gonna, the train is gonna jump the tracks. Yeah. You cannot go from a state of agitation to You can't do it. Right. But you can slow a state of agitation down. Mm -hmm. And the way you do it is the five second rule. So you're feeling the butterflies, you're feeling the nerves, you're feeling the armpit sweating, five, four, three, two, one. That'll stabilize the situation and stop your mind from expanding and making it worse. Now you can take that anchor thought. Pick something before the meeting. This is critical. Don't try to create an anchor thought where you're freaked out. Pick something beforehand. So in the case that I'm using that was my situation of going and talking to the school about my son's dyslexia and the IEP and everything else that, that he was needing in terms of special ed, um, I was picking a vision of him sitting in a classroom with the tools that he needed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And coming home and being really like happy. Right. And the second that I would feel I'd be in the meeting and the teacher would say something that was like stern, mm -hmm. so that I'm like, uh oh, she's not on our side. I'd be like five, four, three, two, one. I'm picturing my son with you know, the vision of him coming home, he's actually reading, like yeah. this is incredible, and that stabilizes the worry. And so now I'm in control of my thoughts and I haven't done what I used to do, which is the second I start feeling the pit in my stomach, my thoughts go catastrophic, they're not gonna give him the services, my son is gonna never read, he's gonna be bullied, this is gonna blah! Right. And now, by the way, if I were to have allowed that to happen, when your mind starts to go worry and anxious, it, it hijacks your thinking capacity. They've done all these studies with brain capacity about what happens to your mind when you worry. Mm -hmm. And you actually cannot focus on anything else once it gets too big. Right. So using this technique, you'll be able to stay present in a meeting. You'll be able to stay present in a situation. You'll be able to stay present in a conversation or with another person or on a plane so that you can control what you're thinking. And so I personally have used 54321, marry it with an anchor thought, to cure myself of anxiety. I haven't taken Zoloft in four years. I haven't had a panic attack. I don't even worry about anything. And you know, I, it, this ties into confidence so tightly because confidence is a skill. And it's a skill that you build. And you build it only one way. You cannot think your way to being more confident. You have to prove it to yourself yeah. through action. And you know the thing about confidence that's really interesting is that the more that you start to use it to stop worrying, you'll actually see yourself moving forward in your life. Using confidence to stop, like using the, the five thought? second rule okay. to stop worrying. Yeah. It's just a tool. That's all it is. Right. It's just a little tool that helps you wake up and 
you know, kind of take control and redirect your thoughts and, and, and really have power in the moment and power over your decisions. But there's a really important connection to confidence because as you start to lower self-doubt and worry, mm -hmm. right, you will actually be able to push yourself to take actions or to speak up when normally you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. When you see yourself taking those actions and when you see yourself beating fear and your excuses, you build the skill of confidence. You, you, you're seeing yourself as the kind of person that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what confidence is. Confidence is not a personality trait. It's actually the ability to go from thought into action. So trust yourself that you can do this, that, yes. that you're and capable of yes. doing Yes, and I, I think it's even more than that. I think it's, it's this idea that, because you might not trust yourself. Right. I think that confidence is the willingness to try knowing that you'll either succeed or you'll survive, right? You're gonna either succeed or you're gonna survive, but damn it, you're gonna try. Right. And when you become the kind of person that has that mentality of, hey, I'll either survive this thing, this conversation, or I'm gonna be successful. Yeah. But either way, I'm gonna have it. That is the, that is the mental shift that will help you start to build the skill of confidence. And most people think that, that, hey, confidence is a belief. It is, you know, the more that you see yourself doing things and the more you build competency in something, you start to have less anxiety about it, right? So that's why you believe in yourself. Right. But for those of us that don't believe in ourselves, being told that confidence is believing in yourself, that is horrible advice because you don't know what to do. Well, I don't believe in myself, so don't tell me confidence is believing in myself. I know I don't. Tell me how to build confidence. Right. Well, confidence is built one push at a time. Confidence is built by wrangling those thoughts that you have that stop you, tuning them down, five, four, three, two, one, and pushing forward knowing you'll succeed or you'll survive, but damn it, you're gonna try. Well, I like that, that dichotomy of between not succeed or fail, but succeed or survive. Correct. That this isn't, you know, whatever you're scared of doing, one, the fact that you're scared of it shows that, that you're worried about it. And you're saying that worry is a habit. Yeah. You just you you're used to going to worst case scenario in totally. your Totally. And that's that's by the way, the worst case scenario is your brain's way to protect you from doing something that is uncertain or scary or new. Mm -hmm. So part of your wiring is that you're hardwired in your brain to within an instant go worst case scenario because your brain is worried about things that are uncertain, scary or new. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a habit and it's also a mechanism in your mind that is tricking you into staying safe. And so the key then to confidence, one, so you're saying that confidence is, it's not a trait, it's a skill. Yes. It's so so implying that Let it me can prove be it built, to you. it yes. can be practiced. Oh, absolutely. Let me prove it to you. If I told you right now that uh, to list everybody in your life that makes you feel good about yourself, okay, those are people that make you feel confident. Now list everybody in your life that when you're around them, you shrink. You feel a little uncomfortable. You feel yeah. a little on edge. You don't feel like you can trust them. Those are people that, are, that make you feel like insecure. Mm -hmm. So confidence can, there are certain areas of your life where you are confident. There are certain areas in your life where you're not confident. There are skills that you have, whether it's cooking or gardening or selling or uh, my husband is like the greatest guy on the planet with Excel. He can, he can do anything on an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet. And I can't do anything on an Excel spreadsheet. But, but so there are skills mm -hmm. that you, you know you can do. You don't even have to think about it. You're not worried about having to do it. I'm that same way about public speaking. Don't even have to think about it. Don't even have to worry because I've practiced it for so long. There are things that I'm terrible at that I lack confidence in. But I could build confidence mm -hmm. by practicing it. Mm -hmm. I could build confidence in myself around people that make me insecure if I were to study the triggers as to why I feel insecure if I were to have conversations with those people, or if I were to become confident enough to distance myself. So your confidence is a skill set, like a muscle that gets built based on experiences, based on the actions that you take, and it's something that's fully within your control and that can be worked on. And for women, oh my gosh, the number one factor in a woman's success is confidence. Perceived confident, confidence yeah. more important than anything. More important than anything. So self-confidence or perceived confidence? Are those different things? Very different things. 
So confidence, there, there are basically a couple different buckets of confidence. There's the internal mindset confidence mm -hmm. that a lot of us don't have that you can build as a skill through action. There is the competency confidence that comes through gaining your, by practicing right. competency. And then there is the external confidence that you project mm -hmm. that other people perceive. Here's something that every single woman needs to know. Harvard Business School just wrote up about this study where they asked a ton of managers across different industries, what is the number one reason why you're not promoting your female you know, people that you're managing? Mm -hmm. Do you know what the manager said? Number one reason. I thought she lacked the confidence for the new role. Now here's the kicker. A kick in the gut, by the way, yeah. is that the managers were uncomfortable telling you, right. the woman, that right. she lacked confidence. Well, because they didn't want to be called sexist, and, and more importantly, they had no idea how to actually coach somebody into becoming more confident. If you're perceived as confident, you make more money, mm -hmm. you advance faster, you have more satisfaction in what you're doing. And the thing that I want every single woman on the planet to understand is that confidence is not a personality trait. You can be extroverted and talk a lot and have zero, zero belief in yourself. That's how I used to be. Mm -hmm. I used to be the loud mouth bossy person that didn't believe a word that was coming out of myself, that my mouth yeah. didn't like myself, none of it. There are tons of folks that are insecure, that, that it's, it's uncomfortable to talk into a meeting. You're not lacking confidence, you believe in your ideas, you're lacking the courage mm -hmm. to actually step out of your comfort zone. The, 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 the one piece of advice that I want every single woman to know is that there are two kinds of work. There's visible work and there's invisible work. You only get credit for visible work. Visible work is how you behave in a meeting. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very important place to practice the skill of confidence. What do you do to practice the skill of confidence? Number one, stop taking notes and just take note. If you have an important meeting, I used to be a lawyer, and you need all the details, hit the memo transcribe thing on your phone. Let Siri take the notes for you. Then take that file, go straight to YouTube, make it a private file, upload it. You know what YouTube will do? Transcribe it. Transcribe it <laughs> for free. Yeah. So now you got your notes. But I don't ever want to see you in a meeting like this. Not like this. Because, because what, you're, yeah, what does that You're in a visible project? place. Yeah. What you're projecting is that you're not part of the meeting. You're just there taking notes. Your physicality is bent over, so now your brain is focused on transcribing. I want you sitting back. I want you jotting, taking note about a few things, and then I want you to do something that may feel uncomfortable. Five, four, three, two, one. Do not leave a meeting without ever talking. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. It is a very visible place for you to be seen. Here's another thing I want you to do. If you're uncomfortable sharing your ideas, and I have been startled by the number of people that write us from around the world that say that their biggest fear in their career was actually speaking in meetings and sharing their ideas. Mm -hmm. Biggest fear. And they started using the five second rule, changing everything about their career trajectory. So one of the things I want you to do in meetings, obviously just take note, don't take notes. Right. Um, I want you to speak in a meeting. If you're uncomfortable, you don't have to share an idea, comment. You know, I, I know we're wrapping up, but I just wanted to say in, in, in listening to all these ideas, I think Shelby's suggestion was a really important strategic consideration that, that, that I really liked a lot. That's it. Right. Now, did you pick up on one word that I used? No. Strategic. They have done studies. This is psycho research, because it'll make you really mad when you hear this. They've done studies. Mm -hmm where they coach women executives to use the word strategic in visible settings. Conversations with your bosses, how you behave in meetings, mm -hmm. emails. Within one year of coaching women, just to say the stupid word, strategic, right. strategery. Strategery, yes. Yeah. Um, the annual reviews and the remarks for how executives are perceived as strategic contributors jumps dramatically, just simply by, the word. by using the word. Here's another thing to pay attention to. Your emails, are they to the point? Do you have the confidence to write an email that is to the point or do you ramble and go all the over the place and, and the I thinks it. and explain right. yourself? So <clears throat> the most important thing that you can develop and work on for yourself, particularly for women, is the skill of confidence. 
Pay attention to visible versus invisible work. Raise your visibility by practicing small acts of confidence. Use the five second rule to interrupt the habits of taking notes, of saying I'm sorry, of writing long-winded emails, of not elevating your ideas. Right. And you'll be surprised by what happens. There's a lot here to talk about, <laughs> and, and that's the thing. I wish we could. I wish we could go on for hours. Well, but, what's something uh, that success that your success readers and your listeners that it, like? It, it, what are some of the big issues? And I'll tell you how to use the five second rule to, to immediately, in combination with the latest research, to solve them. Well, I think I think anxiety is a big one there. Yeah. Because I that's something that people don't talk about. Yes. And and especially you know I love the fact that you said that you know you take medication for your heart you take medication for you know for diabetes yeah some people have to take medication for you know for anxiety and for depression yes um i i think that's an important point because people will automatically when when you're beating yourself up in your brain you are also thinking that it's it's you know something to be ashamed of if you're suffering from anxiety or if you're suffering from depression welcome to the club <laughs> and that's the thing is that that's, that's what i love what you're saying though is that Everybody has it. Really, everybody does. Yeah, and if you don't have it, somebody you love does. Yeah. And so understanding what it is and what it isn't is super, super important. You know, and if you have somebody that has panic attacks, that's, that's even one more step removed from anxiety. We talked about anxiety and worry earlier. When somebody that you love goes into a state of panic, mm -hmm. what we know is that their bodies have now gotten so, the, the body experience, the heart racing, the, the sweating, because they didn't stabilize their thoughts mm -hmm. and the spotlight effect took over and now the brain is magnifying what's going on, now the brain is in an emergency state. Right. And the brain is now really believes that you're having a heart attack or yeah. believes that your life is in danger. So if you have a loved one that suffers from panic attacks, what you've probably experienced is that they immediately need to leave the room. They immediately start thinking that they're having a heart attack. Now the reason why your brain goes into that DEFCON 10 kind of mode is because if you're standing in your kitchen and you're getting ready for um, the day, and you're, you're, you have a loved one that's anxious about what's about to happen. Maybe it's a tough conversation at work. Maybe there's a presentation. Maybe they have to travel. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe they just have a panic attacks because it's become a habit, a default mode that's, right. that's encoded. It just is what it is. And they all of a sudden start to freak out. Oh my God, something's wrong, something's wrong. I can't, I can't, like my son would be like, I can't drink, I can't, something's, <coughs> something's in my throat. Like he would yeah, just, yeah. what's happening is your mind Let's go back to the example of Shelby being at the Sting concert. When she's at the Sting concert and her body starts to get butterflies, the mind has context for why there are butterflies and it calls it excitement. If you're standing in your kitchen and you start to obsess over a conversation you need to have with your boss, or you start to obsess over something that you're, you're nervous about doing in the business that you're building, and your body starts to then match those thoughts right. and you get the butterflies and the sweats, first level is gonna be anxiety the thoughts are gonna to start to spiral. You're gonna to start to obsess over what you have to do. You're gonna do that worst case scenario thing. If you don't five, four, three, two, one and stabilize and inter stabilize your mind and interrupt that pattern, what's gonna happen next is your body will go into full panic mode. Because if your thoughts get super crazy and worried, yeah. your brain is gonna to start to go, holy, what is going on? She, she, she must be having a heart attack because she's standing in a kitchen and this doesn't make any sense. Why would her body be freaking out? Right. Your body's freaking out because I've let my, my thoughts go bananas. So now my heart's really racing. So now my mind's going, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Maybe she is having a heart attack. Right. Maybe there is something wrong. Maybe there's something in this room. And so your mind goes into overdrive. Now, have you ever had the experience where you, um, you hear a loud noise and you're like that? Yeah. There are two, um, two responses, automatic responses that we're born with in our brains to protect us. One is ducking our heads. Even a baby, really, the age of six months, ducks their head at a loud noise. Highly extinctual behavior to protect you. Yeah. Another one is to reach out and stabilize yourself mm -hmm. as you're falling. So as you get kind of wobbly, you don't even think about it. Your mind takes over and directs your body. Yeah. So if you develop a habit of anxiety and panic attacks, 
basically you're escalating everyday life concerns through this funnel mm -hmm. from worry to anxiety to the anxiety then escalating the body to now your mind going holy cow i better protect them right. so that's why they get you out of the room that's why you start to think you're dying so that you'll get help so that's why it's so important for you to start by addressing and fighting any worry that you have and redirecting your thoughts. Uh, if you start to struggle with anxiety, that's why it's so important to start using this strategy 54321, now an anchor thought, to stabilize the thoughts. And if you have panic attacks, same thing, exact same thing. Now it's gonna be very hard to get somebody out of a panic attack. The best way to right. deal with a panic attack is to just sit with the person and say, and what else? And what else? Tell me what else you're worried about. Tell me, because if you can get all those thoughts out of the head. So tell them to verbalize all Oh, yes, stuff. yes, yes. Talk, 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 talk. And then slowly, and, and, and have them walk as they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Because the physicality of it kind of unwinds it. Yeah. And then, when they're just kind of buzzing, five, four, three, two, one, now let's go to the anchor thought. Okay. That's how you deal with it. Excellent. Oh, t trust me. I've done it with myself. My husband's done it with me. My Kids have, have, it works like a charm. I remember um, when my son was really struggling with anxiety, we were driving, he was trying to build up to doing a sleepover and we used this technique, the five, four, three, two, one, with an anchor thought of him being super excited and waking up happy and all this stuff. And there's research out of Harvard um, that's recently been published where they call it, um, I think they call it, re, it's not reframing, it's re, reappraising performance anxiety, if you want to Google it, reappraising performance anxiety. They did this test where they, um, had, they had people that were about to either run a race, sing in a karaoke contest, or take a test, mm -hmm. use a strategy very similar to what I'm talking about. So right before you're about to take a test or run a race, we all have performance anxiety, right? So they trained kids in control groups. One control group would say, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to run this race. I'm excited to take this test. I'm excited to give this speech. The other group, they told them to just think positive thoughts without the I'm excited. Because remember what we talked about in the beginning, Shelby being at the Sting concert, being excited, exact same body state as me standing outside a, a, a meeting for my dyslexic son's IEP. Butterflies, butterflies, flutterflies. She's excited, I'm nervous. Yeah. So they had students before they were about to perform, track or whatever, you know, yeah. or karaoke. I'm excited, I'm excited. In every single instance, every single one, they perform better. Why? Because by saying I'm excited, you give your mind context for the butterflies and guess what else it does? It doesn't allow worry to hijack your mind so you can actually now have your full prefrontal cortex to focus on performing because you're not focused on managing all this garbage. Right. Works in study after study after study. Not only, you know, you might not lose the jitters, but you gain control of your brain. Right. So the five second rule. Wait, first off, when yeah, did you me. discover the five second rule? Okay, so 2009. That's when you first tried it or discovered it or? Oh, it's a total horror show mistake. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So 2009, um, I was unemployed and feeling you like- You unemployed? How? Well, okay. You too much charisma, too much passion. Uh, yeah, because everything's working right now. That's why. <laughs> I'm not like this when I, things are not working. <laughs> sure, sure. Ask my husband of 22 <laughs> years. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, what had happened is um, I, I had had all these career changes and I got into the media business again by mistake. I had a coaching business and um, Inc. Magazine was writing an article about coaches and they featured me in it and CNBC called. Got it. And <laughs> that led to me doing some stuff with CNBC and um, I spent a year still coaching people and then doing some stuff for CNBC and then Fox called. And they were interested in having me host a television show. Now, you got to understand, I'm from North Muskegon, Michigan. Mm -hmm. I mean, the media business, <laughs> Fox, LA, yeah. Yeah. the closest thing I had ever seen to a, ce a celebrity, Lewis, was the Muskegon Lumberjacks, the farm <laughs> team, right? Right. From our, the, for, for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, the, my the dad, double A team or whatever. Yeah, my dad was the hometown doc for the hockey team there. <laughs> right, right, right. So I thought, the mayor was a celebrity. wow, <laughs> my life's about to change. I'm about to be a celebrity. Wow, we're going to solve all, this is amazing, you know? 
So um, I was originally going to be hosting a, a show for Fox where we were making over small businesses. <clears throat> nice. Yeah, pretty cool, right? We show up, we like do extreme home makeover mm. for the office. Everybody's happy. We all know that doesn't solve business problems, <laughs> right. but it makes for a nice television show. By the time I get to L.A., um, they've changed the format. It's now called Someone's Gotta Go, and I'm going to be firing people on national television from real jobs. Wow. Uh-huh. That sounds fun. Horrible. Oh, my gosh. Plus, we haven't told the offices that this is what we're doing. Oh, my gosh. So you show up in Act 1, and you've got everybody all like this because they think they're going to get new IKEA furniture and a paint job, and this is going to be the best thing in the world for their small business. Now, meanwhile, I'm a fourth-generation small business owner, so right. that's like my people. Grew up at a kitchen table with farmers and, you know, my mom at a retail store and my other grandparents were bakers. And so when it comes to like the heart and soul and what's so important when you launch your own business and how personal it is, I mean, this was like gut wrenching. So I show up the first act, you kick out the the owner of the company who then freaks out, then all the employees freak out. Act number two, we announce that somebody's getting fired. And then wow. that's, that's the, the bad news. The good news is that I'm not picking. We're going to have you vote somebody out. So oh it's Survivor in an office place. Oh, my goodness. So that sucks. When, when I learn all this, I, I have a panic attack, even though I'm on Zoloft. And I call the guy that got me the gig and say, you got to get me out of this. Like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to mm -hmm. me. And he said, um, well, I'm sorry, but they've already cast the entire show and you're out there for five weeks and you don't have a choice. Or they're going to sue you. And oh I said, gosh. then fine, get me some Xanax because I don't think I can get through this thing. Like, this is awful. <laughs> Luckily... Um, we taped two episodes and um, legal tabled it. Mm. But here was the problem. I was attached to the show. And I only got paid if the show was shooting. Mm -hmm. so and being an entrepreneur, <laughs> I also kind of put, yes, yeah. put all my energy into this, <clears throat> shut down the coaching thing. Um, yeah. Uh, really thought that the, it also kind of negotiated a deal that was a sort of a back end deal thinking I'm a, you know, entrepreneur always sure, thinking sure. about got to have Take a piece a of the action yes of the, yeah, of course. What a, yeah that was a dumb move <laughs> um and i was in a contract for a year while they figured out what to do mm, so you couldn't do another show yeah so you know i just felt like i had made a, a huge mistake and i felt really embarrassed and i didn't know at the age of 41 what i should be doing with my life and while it's neat that i had jumped careers so many times i started to mm. feel like somebody that actually wasn't successful at all because I didn't have a career track. I had a bunch of jumps from one thing to another. Now, looking back, it makes perfect sense. But standing in the middle of the mess, it just felt like everything was caving in. Probably mm -hmm. just like when you were sleeping on your couch, Absolutely. feeling injured and like everything I thought that was about to happen isn't happening now. Meanwhile, my husband had opened up a restaurant business. It had been his dream. He worked in high tech and came home one day after getting laid off and said, I, I'm never going to get on a plane and do a PowerPoint presentation for a company. I don't care about her own and I said great what's your plan and he said I'm gonna open a pizza restaurant and I mm. looked at him and I said was there a trust fund that was part of this marriage that I was unaware of because I'm not quite sure how we're gonna get the money yeah, exactly. <laughs> did someone die you got an insurance policy yes. and he said no and um <laughs> Uh, I then said the most famous lines of our 22 marriage 22 year marriage Lewis I looked at him and I said listen buddy inspiration is for strangers. You get your ass back to that job and you pay the mortgage and you forget the stream. You're not going to this. Wow. So we, well, because change is scary. Yeah. So we fought and he won. And the first one was a real home run. And he opened was, a pizza store. Oh, he did. Yeah. 40, 40 seats right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. He and his best friend. And it, they won did Best well. of Boston. It was incredible. What do you do when everything? money, though. They did on the first one. Okay. So what do you do when, when do everything's working? Woo, let's go all chips in. Let's put in the home equity line. Let's put wow. in the, the kids' college savings. Let's get friends and family. And because you're so excited, you, you think it's going to work. Yeah. So you go big, big, big. Well, the second one did not work at all. And it did not work at all so badly mm. that when it was finally closed, it was close to an $800,000 loss. And mm. it meant our entire home equity line, kids' college savings, everything went right down with it. Mm. That was right when... I lost the Fox show. So I'm unemployed. The liens start hitting the house. Um, the phone starts ringing all the time, and it's collections calls. Mm. So you unplug that the phone. That would stress me out. Well, you just unplug the phone. Oh, my I mean, that's gosh. how you deal with that. But I... I I, I remember like, there were, I remember two things from that period of my life that were really painful, and one was having to call the town and tell them that we could not afford the 175 bucks for our sixth grader to 
play soccer, so we needed to pull her out. And wow. I remember there being times, because I was so afraid to look at the checking account, that I would stand at the grocery store and items would scan and I could just feel that wave of anxiety rising, thinking, I don't, I don't think the check card's going to go through. And so I would stand there. I always had an excuse, and it was to look at the person and go, oh, that's strange. It just worked at the gas station. Oh, my gosh. Because I, what would have been more empowering is to probably say, oh, well, I guess I don't have the money for this. Let's take this, this, and this. And just kind of like the easiest thing to do is to tell the truth. But I was so filled with shame. Yeah. So I started to develop this habit of hitting the snooze button. Because what would happen is the alarm would go off in the morning. And the first thing I would think about is all the problems that we had. And how awfully things had gone off the tracks. And you didn't want to deal with them. No, and I, and I also didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't think I could. And this goes back to the feelings. Like you, you think that you need to feel confident or courageous in order to get started. You don't. You actually just have to start. And that's the riddle of life. That lying in bed, hoping that you wake up some morning motivated to change. That's not the answer. You actually have to learn how to push yourself. You have to learn how to, how to leverage the power of your decisions. And you've got to learn how to take action when you don't f feel like it. Mm -hmm. Because every morning when I woke up, I did not feel confident. I felt like a loser. Yeah. I felt like the world's worst parent. I felt like I had failed at every single turn. I did not know if Chris and I could pull out of the spiral. I did not know if we were going to go bankrupt and lose the house and move from our community. I did not know if our marriage would survive. I knew I wanted it to. And see, this is the knowledge action gap. You can know what you want. You can know what you should be doing. But how do you make yourself do it when the feelings and the motivation isn't there, when all you got is fear? And so every night I would, I would lie in bed and I would say to myself, all right, that's it, Mel. Tomorrow, it's the new you. Tomorrow, you're going to wake up and be motivated. You're going you're gonna to get up. You're going to exercise like everybody says you should. You're going to meditate. You're going to get those kids on the bus. You're going to screw Fox. You're going to look for a job. You're going to cold call Cox Media, and you're going you're gonna to do auditions. Come on, girl. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You're going to take a cold shower. Woo! You know, here we go. <laughs> and I meant it when I was saying it. Maybe it was the alcohol that was talking. But, but then I would wake up, and I didn't feel any of those things. Mm -hmm. So I would hit the snooze. And I would hit the snooze. Now, why was I hitting the snooze when I knew it wasn't the right decision? I'm going to tell you why. And this is something that I was blown away by when I discovered it. You don't make decisions with your goals. You don't make decisions with your prefrontal cortex. You don't make decisions with logic. Do you know how we make decisions? I didn't invent this. A neuroscientist by the name of Damasio, who does his research in Brazil, who gave an incredible <laughs> TED Talk and wrote about this forever and ever and ever. We make decisions with feelings. 95% of our decisions are made by how you feel in the moment. And that is the problem. You need to take control of the moment and leverage the power of your decisions and make them up here. Because when I was lying in bed, I wasn't saying to myself, I should get up because that's going to help me start my day right. I was saying, do I feel <laughs> like getting up? No, you don't. No. Do you feel like making that cold call? No, you don't. Do you feel like doing that third set of reps? No, you don't. Do you feel like having that hard conversation? No, you don't. Do you feel like ending this relationship, whether it's in business or in your life, that is sucking you dry? No, you don't. We make decisions based on our feelings, and that is robbing you of joy and opportunity. And it is blinding you from the fact that all how you change your life is one five second decision at a time one push at a time mm -hmm. and if you if you accept the fact that you may never feel ready and you may never feel motivated and you may never feel confident you may never feel courageous and that's okay but you can still push yourself forward what happens over time is as you start mm -hmm. to see yourself becoming the person that takes action that you start to see yourself becoming the kind of person that speaks, even though your voice is shaking. You're the kind of person that, that, that has a bias toward moving instead of a bias toward thinking. Guess what happens? You build the skill of confidence and courage. And so what happened for me is I was stuck, Lewis. I mean, I was so stuck. I was on, I mean, we were heading straight for divorce. 
We were heading for bankruptcy. I knew I wanted to change things. Mm. And so one night I see this commercial. This is the stupidest story on the planet, but this is what happened. <laughs> I see this commercial. <laughs> and, you know, again, I, I also was drinking too much. I mean, I probably had a couple Manhattans <clears throat> in me. Sure. That's my drink. I'm from the Midwest, All just right. like you. Yeah. All right. A little Manhattan there. <laughs> a little bourbon. Um, and uh, there was a rocket ship launching. On a commercial. Yeah. Yeah. And I had this instinct, this innovation, this disruptive idea, right? Oh, my God, Mel, that's the answer. Tomorrow morning, you're going to launch your ass out of bed like a rocket ship. You're going to move so fast, you can't even think about your problems. Dumb, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Totally dumb. See, it's like this is the dumbest idea I've ever <laughs> but, heard. I cannot believe I have this chick on my podcast. No, I understand. I understand it. You got to get moving first. Yes, that's the thing. You just got to wake up at six a.m. or whatever it is, and go into the gym. And when you're in the gym, you're going to start moving the first weight, yes. and then you'll start yes. moving the second Actually, weight. Yes, actually, people people <clears throat> use the five second rule at the gym because you know yeah. how much time people waste at the gym standing around thinking about the next thing. Probably seventy percent of the time. Five, right? four, three, two, one. So, yeah. so the next morning the alarm goes off, and nothing had changed in my life. I woke up. To the lean on the house, the fighting with Chris, the mm-hmm. unemployment, the lack of confidence, the lack of courage, the, like the whole thing. But I did something I had never done before. I went five, four, three, two, one, just like NASA. I actually counted. And then I stood up and I was like, <laughs> what the hell just happened? Uh-huh. What? What? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> the next morning I used it again, it worked. The next morning I used it again, it worked. And then I started to notice something, and this is this is one of those things. So we have a we have an eleven year old son who has dyslexia, mm. and when they finally diagnosed him, it was as if, of course, it was as if like how could we have possibly missed this? Are we the worst parents in the world? Mm. I mean, the kid can barely write. He can't cut his food. He doesn't read. Like no wonder he doesn't do team sports. Mm. It was right under our nose, and what I'm about to tell you is right under everybody's nose. There's a five second window between the instincts, the shoulds the urges, the inner wisdom, the things that can change your life if you listen to it. Got a five second window from the moment you feel that instinct to move. And if you don't, your brain is actually designed to kill it. Five seconds is all you have. The second you hesitate, it's actually, and you feel yourself hesitating, that is a moment of huge power because what's happened is you've just started to pull back from something that you need to lean into. And if you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and this is the neuroscience behind why this stupid little trick works, counting is is an action. Mm. Counting backwards requires focus. It's also not a habit for you yet. So when you feel yourself hesitate, you're, you're, you're triggering your mind that something's up. Like Lewis didn't hesitate when he pulled on his pants. He didn't hesitate when he's drinking his coffee. He didn't hesitate when he walked out the door to the gym, but now he's hesitating to make that call. Your mind now goes into a cognitive bias called the spotlight effect. It magnifies whatever it was that you hesitated doing. Mm-hmm. The moment. And the yeah. moment. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you're like, hey, I don't feel like it. Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll do it later. Right. And your mind is doing it because your mind's trying to protect you. Hesitation signals a red flag to your mind that something's up. Just that small hesitation. It's a habit that we all have. Should you hesitate if you're getting a tattoo? Yes. Should you hesitate <laughs> if you're gambling? Yes. Should you hesitate if you are signing a legal document? Yes. You need your prefrontal cortex for those things. You need to interrupt it, make a power, make a decision. Should you hesitate on making a phone call? No. Should you hesitate on speaking up in a meeting? No. Should you hesitate when you feel yourself starting to procrastinate and you know you got work that you should get done? No, you shouldn't hesitate at all. Should you hesitate in saying the thing that you really feel in your heart? No, you shouldn't. Should you hesitate and edit yourself when you're talking? No, you shouldn't. But we've all trained ourselves to. So it's actually this habit of hesitating. You start catching yourself. It's a huge moment of power because you have a decision to make and you got to make it in the next five seconds. Are you going to go on autopilot and get trapped in your mind? Or are you going to five, four, three, two, one and awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward? Mm. So um, I started to use this rule as I noticed that every day, all day long, I had these moments of inner wisdom where I would know that I needed to pick up the phone and stop isolating myself. Mm -hmm. I would know that I needed to call a bunch of media companies and start auditioning for radio show hosting gigs. I knew that I should get on, get out of bed on time. I knew I should stop myself before I snapped at Chris, Mm -hmm. right? Self monitor. Yeah. I knew I should not feel, let the frustration 
be the things that was driving me. And so I started to use the rule all day long. Whenever I felt this, I should do this, five, four, three, two, one, and I would make myself do it. And slowly, five seconds at a time, my entire life start, started to change. And my husband used it in his business, and he and his business partner dove in. They went on to open seven more restaurants. Um, mm. I went on to launch and sell two businesses <clears throat> wow. and get recruited by CNN and join their team. I had a syndicated radio show that that um, ended up winning the Gracie Award, which is kind of the female media, you know, awards for nice. the number one talk show in the country. Um, and, you know, I never intended to tell anybody about the five second rule. First of all, because it's stupid. Right. I mean, <clears throat> come on. Count backwards. That's the dumbest That's thing. That's stupid to me, though. Well, Anything that works, works for me. That's true. You know what I mean? I'll take any stupid thing. That's true. <laughs> I, and so, I, but I also was like, how do you start talking about something like that, right? Yeah. So um, I was asked to give a TED Talk like six years ago. And TED six years ago, not the brand that it was today. Yeah. They weren't even putting the talks online yet. Really? Yeah. The TEDx wow. talks were not online yet. And so that was the first speech I'd ever given in my life. If you want to see what somebody looks like having a panic attack for 21 <laughs> minutes straight, watch that speech. I was backstage and it was like one PhD after another going out there. I'm They're like, what the hell yeah. have I gotten myself into? This yeah. is the dumbest thing. Um, mm. And so at the very end, I wasn't even planning on talking about it. I say, oh, by the way, there's this thing I do. That's it. I don't even explain it. And you know why I didn't explain it, Lewis? I didn't know why it worked. Mm. So you didn't have the science, the research. You were just Zero. Like- Zero. And then something crazy happened. They put that talk online a year later and people started to write. We've heard from more than 100,000 people in 90 countries that have written to us that are using the rule in ways big and small to change their lives, to change their marriages, to change their thinking patterns, to grow their businesses. Um, We know of 11 Mm. people that have stopped themselves from killing themselves. Wow. Um, in the moment, there's a gentleman that we talk about in the book and you can see his social media posts in London. He was a, he was a veteran and he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and he boarded a ferry with the intention of jumping overboard. Mm. And he got to the railing and he was standing there and his inner wisdom kicked in. And this is another thing I want everybody watching to understand. I don't care what you're facing or how low you get. Your inner wisdom is always there. It is. And the thing is, is that we often don't listen to it. And so he's standing there intending to kill himself and that inner wisdom kicks in and he remembers the five second rule and he goes five, four, three, two, one and he turns and physically moves away from the railing and finds the first person working on the ferry and tells him that he's suicidal. Mm. Saved his life. Wow. He saved his life because he listened to the inner wisdom. And this is the other thing I love about this rule. It's not something to think about. It's a tool to use. So the part of the problem with a lot of the advice that I've found for me personally is that a lot of advice is all about kind of doing mental battle. Mm -hmm. And if I go upstairs, I'm behind enemy lines and I tend to get hijacked. Right. So I love this tool because 54321 interrupts those patterns it actually prompts the part of the brain that I need in order to change. And it makes changing easier because I've now got my mind working for me instead of against me. And it gets me out of my head. And so um, I'm, I'm super excited to share this rule with people mm. because I now know not only that it's working, just not, not for me, it's working for people around the world. And, you know, in the book, it took me three years to write it. It's all the science behind the rule. It's got more than 150 social media posts in it. So you see stories from around the world of people using it to end procrastination, to build confidence, to deepen their relationships, to launch businesses, to explode the sales. Why does it help with sales? I'll tell you why. Because you can't sell by thinking. Selling is about action. We have... We have... um, um, <coughs> groups from companies around the world, sales teams that put five, four, three, two, one up on the wall. Really? I'm sure they hate me. That's cool. Yes, because what cold calling? It's a momentum thing. It if you is. stop and think, the phone is not getting the dialing is not happening when you're thinking. Yeah, if you're thinking about all those no's you've been getting, yes, you're not going to want to do it again. Yes, it doesn't feel good. Yes, and if you're in the middle of a negotiation or you're in the middle of a really difficult conversation, and again, remember what we said earlier, you cannot control your feelings that rise up. But you can always control how you think and what you do. So if you're in the middle of a difficult conversation and you feel those feelings come up that normally trigger you, 
to start editing yourself or to censor yourself or to silence yourself or to think sabotaging thoughts in like a business negotiation, five, four, three, two, one, awaken the prefrontal cortex, mm. get back in the game. In this video, I am going to teach you not one, but two research backed science supported tools you can use in order to get out of bed when the alarm rings, in order to beat the anxiety, dread, or depression that pins you down, because I'm sure you know that the second you get out of bed and you get moving and you start your day, you start to feel better. Um, oftentimes, laying in bed thinking about your problems is the worst place that you can be. And so um, <laughs> the other reason why I wanted to make this video is because a little while ago, I posted this video of me online, uh, a short little video demonstrating how I slither out of bed. And slithering out of bed is a brand new technique that uh, a therapist that I'm working with uh, taught me how to do because the anxiety that I was feeling in my life uh, was so overwhelming, I was having a hard time getting out of bed. So. What are we gonna cover in this video? Well, I'm gonna cover two things that you can do to help you push through any anxiety, overwhelm, depression, whatever is like keeping you pinned in bed, okay? We're gonna talk about the five second rule, which is what I would call a neck up tool. It's a tool that works on your mind and gives you control over your thinking so that you can take control and force yourself out of bed. And then I'm gonna demonstrate what slithering out of bed looks like, which is what my therapist refers to as a neck down embodied tool that will help you on those days that you just can't force yourself to do it. Okay, so let me demonstrate both ways. So first we're gonna talk about the five second rule. So, and I've got a bunch of your questions here because boy oh boy did you guys love that slithering video. So um, you're in bed. And for me, the bed is my favorite place to be, okay? I just love being a bed. And this isn't even my bed. This is a bed in a rental. Uh, you know, we're here at the beach for a little bit and this is the bed in the rental. So it's not even my bed, I still love this bed. So you're sleeping, right? And so for me, I'm somebody who has struggled with anxiety Boy, for probably four decades, I think if you can be, I should probably just sit up and talk to you. I think if you should be, I mean, we only just met, I shouldn't be laying down as I'm sharing this with you. If you could come out of the womb having a panic attack, that was me. I was the kind of kid who was always nervous, had a worried stomach. I um, got sent home from every camp I went to because I was homesick. And I also uh, experienced uh, sexual abuse when I was nine years old. In the middle of the night at a sleepover, an older kid climbed on top of me and I disassociated. I literally left my body. And the next morning after it happened, I woke up and I just felt this overwhelming sense of dread. I knew something bad had happened. I was scared. I was overwhelmed by it. And I have to tell you, and I share this because it's such a common experience. There are very few mornings in the last 44 years since that initial morning where I have woken up and felt like okay and calm. Most mornings I wake up and my body still has that stored sense of dread in it. Now, about 13 years ago, um, when my anxiety was really bad, as you can tell, it's not very bad right now, I invented something I call the five second rule. And the five second rule is very simple. The moment you hear that alarm ring and you feel the resistance or the hesitation pinning you down, you're just gonna count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, okay? And then you're gonna move. And so I started counting five, four, three, two, one, I had to launch myself out of bed every morning. Uh, and we call this a neck up approach because you're using your thinking and your mental power to create the strength and discipline to push through the resistance you feel to getting out of bed. Now, you're not gonna wanna do this, I get it, because you're cozy, 
You also wake up in the morning and your cortisol levels are their highest. If you have any kind of stored trauma in your body from abuse or from growing up in a chaotic household, you probably feel a sense of overwhelm every morning. That's normal, it's okay. You can still get out of bed. If you're not a morning person and you just hate getting up because you're cranky, you can still get out of bed and the five second rule will help you. Here's how you do it. So the alarm goes off, right? I typically sleep like this, I burrow. The second you hear the alarm go off, you're gonna count backwards. Five, four, three, two, one. And then you're gonna throw the sheets off, put your feet on the ground and start your day. Walk into the bathroom. Okay, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna start moving. So you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. That moves you from the subconscious part of your brain where your habit of overthinking and hitting the snooze button and feeling heavy and laying in bed and thinking about all the things that are wrong in your life and dreading your day, which only makes you wanna go, I don't wanna get up. When you go five, four, three, two, one, you cut off those thinking loops. You activate your prefrontal cortex. It draws your focus to this part of your brain and it gives you a moment where you can choose. The movement's critical. Five, four, three, two, one, put your feet on the floor, start moving, and you will feel in control, okay? You'll feel that resistance leave your body. And what's super cool about practicing the five second rule in the morning is that resistance that you feel going from a comfortable, safe, just cozy place in your bed and learning how to five, four, three, two, one, push yourself to choose a different, harder behavior, namely getting up. When you build the muscle of being able to push through the resistance and the dread, you can do it anywhere in your life. So if you're in a meeting at work and you feel nervous about speaking up, if you've been practicing the five second rule in the morning by pushing yourself out of bed and getting your day started, that little skill of courage in the morning is a skill you can now tap into to have courage at work to speak up in meetings. You can use that same skill, pushing yourself out of bed uh, to push yourself off the couch and out the door to go for a walk. You can use that same skill in the morning of pushing yourself out of bed to push yourself out the door and force yourself to go hang out with friends, even though you feel like, you know, you'd rather kind of stay in because you're feeling a little nervous about it. So that skill of recognizing those moments where you start to give in to resistance and doubt and overwhelm and anxiety and practicing this little countdown that switches gears in your brain and then moving, that is a skill that will pay dividends far beyond helping you start your day and set your day up, which is so important because you know on those days that you actually get out of bed and you do a few simple habits in the morning to set yourself up for success, your whole, your whole day is better. Okay, so that's the five second rule. If you wanna learn more about that, you should listen to the five second rule audiobook on Audible, but now let me teach you this second technique. The second technique is called slithering. So I was introduced to slithering out of bed very recently. I've only been practicing slithering out of bed for about six weeks. And what had happened in my life is <clears throat> I had uh, had a bunch of major life changes go down. Uh, my husband and I had sold a family home of 26 years and were moving to a very rural area, which is a huge change. I was making major changes in my business, which were very, very confronting. Um, I had uh, one of our kids have a bit of a mental breakdown and as a parent, that was terrifying. And all these things happened literally within about a five day window. And I just felt knocked over by life. And you know, the other fact is, is that I think that for me personally, trying to navigate uh, my business and my family and my mental health and so many changes through the pandemic and running a company, it's just beat the heck out of me. And after two years, I was sort of paper thin in terms of my emotional resilience. And so when our house sold and I freaked out and our son started having panic attacks and I freaked out and then all kinds of changes happened in my business and I freaked out in a four day window, I 
had an empty tank in terms of emotional resilience to be able to handle it. And I started experiencing these massive waves of anxiety. I hadn't experienced anything this terrifying in 23 years. That's the truth. And I would wake up every morning and I would feel, I'd feel the anxiety start here and it would just go all the way up my body and up my neck and I would feel pinned down with terror. What have I done? Why do we sell the house? I'm not gonna be happy. I'll never see my kids. How are we gonna help our son? I'm really scared he's not gonna be okay. What do I do if something happens to him? How am I gonna handle all this? Like just the churn of angst and worry and concern and fear. And I was trying to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. But the depression and the changes and the overwhelm were too much. I couldn't push through the heaviness that I felt. I felt like there was like a semi truck parked on me every single morning, the weight of the world. And so my therapist said, you know, Mel, between all these changes and the anxiety it's provoking and the depression that you're feeling and the grief that you're feeling, closing such a big chapter by selling your family home and the fact that you're in menopause, this is a tsunami that's going on in your body and your spirit and your emotions. And she said, the five second rule is wildly effective, but it's a neck up approach. You need a neck down body approach to this. And it had never occurred to me that there was a tool that would embody your strength instead of mustering through something, which is what the five second rule is so effective in doing, giving you that push, that moment of courage, that moment of motivation. There is a more embodied approach that you can take in these moments where you don't have the energy. And so you surrender to what's happening. Wait till you see this, it's really weird and it's really cool. Um, and I believe that this is called somatic therapy. And uh, there's lots of types of somatic therapy from meditation to um, I, oh, people shake and they tap, but this is an embodied approach to those mornings where the depression, the problems in your life, the sadness that you feel, the grief, the anxiety, it just, is too heavy to bear. You are going to give into it. You're gonna to surrender to it. You're going to slither and fall out of bed. Because if you think about it, slithering to the ground is succumbing to the heaviness, isn't it? You're moving with the resistance. And then, and I'm gonna demonstrate it in a minute. So you're gonna move with the resistance and then you're going to roll around on the floor in any kind of shape that feels to you like the resistance and heaviness in your body. So you might roll around in a ball, you might stretch out, you might writhe, and then as you're rolling around, at some point, you will feel ready to roll onto your hands and knees. And then get this, then you're gonna crawl and you're gonna to start to crawl across the floor toward the bathroom. And then at some point, you're just going to have be ready to stand up. It is the strangest, most amazing thing. And so I've been practicing this for about six weeks and I'm now at the point where I don't really feel that anxiety in the morning anymore. Uh, the slithering has really worked. I don't dread the feeling because I know what to do if counting backwards isn't enough. So let me show you slithering, this sort of embodied approach to getting out of bed. So when you wake up oh, and you feel that heaviness, what I would do is the first thing I would do is I would high five my heart, which I, taught you in the high five habit. I put a hand here and a hand here and I just say, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. And that hand right here and right here, it just really grounds me and it tones the vagus nerve, 
which helps to flip from a state of fight or flight, dread, fleeing into a calmer place. And then I think about the fact that I'm about to slither out of this bed. I don't want to slither out of this bed. I don't feel ready to slither out of this bed. This is not something that makes me happy. This is not something that I want to do. Slithering out of bed in a moment where I'm depressed or grieving or anxious because I know that I'll feel better once I get moving, slithering out of bed is what I need to do. And so there would be mornings that I would use the five second rule to initiate it. So you can count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. You're under your covers, five, four, three, two, one. And then, I mean, you literally move in the direction of the floor. You just succumb to the resistance and then you're gonna move around. And, you know, there would be mornings Honestly, in the past six weeks that I would get to this point and I'd want to crawl in a fetal position like this and I'd lay there for a minute and then the dog would come over and lick me and then I'd move like this. And then the more that I did it, the less I would lay on the ground. I'd just kind of roll around and stretch. And then eventually when you're ready, whatever shape you want, because it's the resistance that you're feeling, you get on all fours and you just start to crawl. And you're staying low to the ground because you're giving in to the heaviness, but you're not throwing in the towel. You're moving with it. You're moving through it. And at some point, as you're crawling, you will feel ready to just stand up. And it's almost like that sort of physical moving moves all that resistance out of you and through you in a way that is organic, it's doable, it feels like in a weird way it sort of acknowledges and honors the depression and the grief or anxiety or sadness or overwhelm that you're feeling. And it's super empowering because you don't have to feel energized or motivated. And there's a lot of mornings where I don't. And knowing that I can use this technique to embody and move with the heaviness inside me as a way to move through it and get my power back, it's, it's absolutely incredible. So I want you to try it. I want you to try slithering. I'm gonna answer some of your questions because you guys blew up my DMs and my comments when I posted that video. Um, how long you've been practicing the slither and why did you start? Well, I've been practicing for six weeks and I started because my therapist recommended it as a way to um, not, as a way to feel empowered uh, while I was facing so many changes in my life that felt too big to bear. That even though life is overwhelming, you still have power inside you to move through the things that are scaring the hell out of you right now. And sometimes you don't have to muster up a ton of strength. Sometimes all you gotta do is slither, seriously. Um, when would I use this technique? Well, you would use this technique, I think any moment where it's just too much to bear. Like I kept saying to my therapist, intellectually, I know that I need to get up. Intellectually, I know that this kind of period from 5.30 a.m. until 10.30 a.m. that it's gonna, get better with time. But physically, I can't push through it. And I'm starting to get scared of it. And so that's when she said, I think you need to lean into it. I think you need to take an embodied approach. And so I think anytime you feel that way, whether you're on the couch, or maybe for you, it's not getting up in the morning. Maybe you spend so much time at night, kind of unwinding from the day that you have a really hard time getting from the couch to your bed. So maybe for you, it's like an end of the day transition from one place that you're sunk into, uh, into your bedroom. Um, have I noticed a difference? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've noticed a huge difference because I now have another tool in my toolbox. I mean, I've been using the five second rule for 14 years to five, four, three, two, one, push myself out of bed, force myself out of bed. 
this feels like something gentle and uh, just powerful in its own way. And I love having two different things I can do. What if I have a dog who will jump all over me? It's actually great because the dog like is worried about you because the dog can sense all that heaviness in you. And the dog also will probably bring some playful energy, which is probably gonna make it fat easier and faster for you to stand up because their energy will transfer to you. Um, what if my bed is high up or I have a wood floor or I sleep and I don't have the mobility to fall out of bed? That's a great question. I, if you have a high bed, roll the foot out first and then you can kind of like slide down, you know, like that and do that. I think if you sleep on the floor, maybe just roll around on the floor. Right? So if you're, you know, on a, a, a futon on the floor, or you sleep on a thermorest or whatever, just roll off the thermorest or roll away from where you are so that you get kind of moving. Um, that's a, probably a great way to start. And so whatever the slither or the slide or the embodiment of moving through the heaviness means to you, that's what you want to do. Um, let's see. Can you teach this technique? To your kids, yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's great for kids actually, because you're honoring how they feel. You're not trying to correct them or coerce them. You're actually creating a deeper connection with them because you're honoring that they don't wanna get out of bed. And so they, oh, it's a morning and you're gonna slither, you're gonna slide out of bed. So you can have fun with it. Um, what if you have a hard time feeling stuff in your body? I actually think this would help. Maybe it's hard to get out of bed because you are disconnected from your body. Like I was surprised, I was kind of scared to try this because if I already felt so scared in my body, it's gonna sound weird, but if I already felt so scared in my body, hiding under the covers gave me a false sense of safety, right? I'm hiding from the world, even though I hate the feelings of my body. So there was something scary about like, allowing myself to slither out of that safe cocoon where I'm fighting from the world into the floor where you're open and, and all this stuff. And so I get that, but you've, I've been empowered by how quickly that heaviness that pinned me to the bed leaves as I roll and move and start crawling and walking. And you know, the more you do it, the more you'll notice the faster you go from like crawling to actually standing up. I'm gonna do it the questions. Oh, we've got one more. Um, can I use somatic therapy in other areas of my life? Absolutely. Like I, 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 somatic therapy, I believe is just using your body as a way to move through things, whether it's meditation or it's deep breathing, or I would imagine that the cold exposure therapy and the ice baths that I do are a form of somatic therapy yoga, um, uh, regardless of what form you practice, Tai Chi, even going outside, hiking, spending time in nature, deeper breathing. Those are all forms of somatic therapy that we all need to integrate more into our day-to-day -day life. We live in a very big world. There is enough room in this world for every single one of you to be successful for every single one of you to have your dreams come true. And you're really not in competition with one another. You're only in competition with yourself. And so I wanna take five minutes to give you the trick to how you disrupt your own behavior and your own perspective. And it starts with a question. How long does it take to actually change? Major change in your business, in your life, in how you are as a leader actually happens in micro moments. And here are gonna be the three obstacles that you're gonna face if you wanna to try to do something new. First of all, it's gonna be your brain, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Secondly, it's success. So the more successful you are, the harder it is for you to change. And the reason why is because, first of all, you've spent years and years doing things a certain way, and you've become very successful because of it, and you've probably convinced yourself that if you do something different, it's gonna sabotage your success. That sort of thinking didn't work out very well for Net, or I mean for Blockbuster, didn't work out very well for Kodak, and it doesn't work out very well for human beings. The other factor, fear. But we're gonna focus on this one, the brain. So I love the tagline for Nike, 
And the reason why is because of this word, just. Their tagline could have been do it, right? But Nike understood something. They understood that even for an, a professional athlete, there's always the moment of hesitation before you're going to take a new action. Physicists actually call it activation energy, the fact that in order to stop doing something like sitting at your computer and actually force yourself to do something else, it takes a certain amount of energy to activate the new behavior. And Nike knew this. That's why the tagline is so powerful. The just is a nod to the fact that there's a moment of hesitation. Where does the hesitation come from? Well, it doesn't come from the pleasure center. How many of you have heard of dopamine or cocaine? Or, you know, this is where, this is where uh, Professor Roberts' rock and roll and emotion and all that stuff, the reward center of the brain, exists. But what you need in order to change behavior, in order to put down the phone, in order to actually reverse mentor, like Lisa was talking about when she said, oh, just get somebody younger who's a digital native to actually mentor you in technology, you need the prefrontal cortex. And here's the problem. The problem is, even though your brain's pretty amazing and this supercomputer that can process information really quickly, it only really has two modes, either autopilot or you disengage from autopilot and you're directing your thoughts. Now, how many of you have ever like driven to work and you get there and you go, oh, who drove the car? You have that feeling like, oh my gosh, I wasn't even thinking and somehow the car got here. Well, you were actually driving the car. It's just that your brain was an autopilot because you've done it so many times the same way. In order to change your behavior, you have to check out of autopilot and check in to drive. You have to use your prefrontal cortex. Now, your brain's going to hate that idea because look at all of these things that are crunching on your head. Whenever you feel stressed, whenever you fall into a routine, whenever you have too much choice, whenever you get overwhelmed by the pace of life or the connectivity that we live in or there's fear, what happens, oops, oops, does anybody know? the attention span of a goldfish? Anybody? Nope, not three seconds. Nope. Close, nine seconds. A goldfish actually has a longer attention span than a human being. <laughs> not kidding. Also, 270 cereal choices in the average American supermarket. 270, 41,000 products in the average supermarket. Your brain, when it's presented with too many choices, either makes the same choice all the time or none at all. This, Bridget was talking about putting down the phone. Do you know that if you have unanswered emails in front of you on your phone, that it lowers your working IQ by 10 points? It's hugely distracting. So what does all this do? The spotlight effect. They did this interesting study at Cornell University where they gave students a Barry Manilow t-shirt, and, of course, they were mortified wearing a Barry Manilow t-shirt. And the students were asked to walk into a room where there were a bunch of people that were facing the door. And then they asked the students, how many people do you think noticed that you were wearing this embarrassing t-shirt? The students thought that at least 50% of them noticed. Turns out only 20% does. Your brain overestimates the amount of attention that is on you. And, you know, honestly, nobody cares what you're doing. They're busy thinking about what they're doing. But by having this spotlight effect, you overestimate how your exposure is. So what happens when these things happen? Well, your brain gets flooded with cortisol, and suddenly you don't feel like doing anything. And this is how it plays out. So if you have a dream, you like want to write a book, immediately, if you think about it, because you need your prefrontal cortex, you're going to get uncertain, and immediately your brain's going to say, nope, not going to do it. If you want to change ad tech platforms, you're suddenly going to feel overwhelmed by the number of choices that are presented to you, and you're going to feel like, oh, I don't want to do it. If you want to volunteer, you got inspired by Blake. Suddenly, you're going to feel like, I don't have any time. Your brain's going to kill the idea. You want to get back in shape? Eh, you're too tired to do that. Brain's going to kill the idea. You want to start dating again? You're a little nervous about that because of all the stalkers online. Within five seconds, five seconds, your brain kills your interest in doing something new. You know exactly what you need to do to change. Everybody does. Raise your hand if you'd like to lose weight or get in better shape. Raise your hand. Yes, we all would. And keep it raised if you know exactly what to do. You have all the information you need. It's just a matter of whether or not you feel like doing it. And that's the fact. Here's the truth. You're never going to feel like it, ever. And you never did. 
People only do the things they're paid to do, that they're pushed to do. That's what we call parenting, or that they feel a deeply personal connection to doing. If you think about what you were like as a kid, you never felt like doing your homework. You never felt like busting the table. You never felt like wearing your Sunday best. You never felt like looking adults in the eyes. You never felt like using your manners. You never felt like clearing the table or feeding the dog or going outside to play or turning off the the、uh, computer. And you still don't feel like doing things. My son never feels like getting off the computer. And then when I come back five minutes later after I've told him to, he gives you that look. You've seen that look before, right? They never feel like actually clothing the Barbies. I don't know why that's the case, but it's true. You only do the things you feel like doing. So when you hear an extraordinary panel like this, or you get inspired by, you know, John from IBM about the the potential for for thinking in machines, and you're at that moment where you're sitting at your desk, and that person walks in that you can't stand at work, and you know you should acknowledge them. Are you going to feel like it? Of course not. It's in that moment that you either do or don't. You have to act within five seconds, and this is how you do it. This is how you're going to practice it at this conference. We only have a few hours left, so I've been trying to drive personal connection, direct connection with direct marketers, and you guys have been really awesome as you're kind of getting the ice is breaking. But I want you to play this game with yourself, so you notice how weird you are. As you scan the room throughout the day, notice who you're drawn to. The second you feel the impulse that this person looks interesting. Start connecting. Lisa told you that the most important thing you could do is network. Start walking within five seconds because if you don't start walking, you're going to be up here and you're going to be like, "Oh, they're talking to somebody I don't know. This looks kind of weird. I'll, I'll catch them at the next session." Not going to happen. Why am I asking you to do something physical? Does anybody know the age at which the brain stops or stops growing? Anyone? Guess. Sixteen. Nope. 25. You would have been correct five years ago. Five years ago, we thought the brain stopped growing at the age of 25. The answer now is never. It stops growing when you're dead. How many of you have heard the word neuroplasticity? Right. So I saw a really interesting way to explain this. The truth is, your brain's always growing and expanding. That's why you can always learn new things, which is amazing because it allows for what we call behavioral flexibility. Meaning, there's no reason for you to ever be stagnant. Not in business, not as a leader, not as a human being. So let me show you what neuroplasticity is. So this kid who's making a handprint, pressing down on the clay, that's what your brain basically does when it's learning new information. So when I'm telling you, you have that impulse to. Start writing a book. You don't start writing right now. Make a note to yourself. Send yourself an email. Turn to the person and talk. Do something physical because that's the first imprint in creating a new neural pathway. So what happens is when you marry impulse with behavior, when you know what you're supposed to do, you don't feel like it, but within five seconds, you actually take some form of action. You're making that first impression. Let me show you a few examples. Does anybody recognize this photo? Amazing story. I'll probably cry when I tell you this. So, the Todd that is in front doing this was the father of the bride, and he was walking his daughter up the aisle just this past week, and he had this impulse. The guy in the back is his daughter's stepdaughter, stepfather. They hate each other. Hate each other. It's been like disastrous for ten years. So he's walking up the aisle with his daughter. He has this impulse, like, "Oh, I really should." Stops within five seconds, starts going through the aisle, grabs Todd, the stepdad, and brings him up, and they walk her up together. This thing has gone global. This is an example of using the five-second rule. Had he not turned and started walking in five seconds, it never would have happened. Another example, Blake. I mean, my gosh, every single twist and turn. You notice how he said, I, "I didn't have a business plan. I just felt something, and so I did it." Your, I, when I speak to CEOs around the world, I, I call it the language of the mind and the language of the soul. You need the language of the mind for opex, gross margin, revenues, bookings, clients, business plan, strategy, product development. You need to listen to the language of the soul for curiosity, for your people, for your dreams, for your inspiration. 
Great leaders do both, and you can use the five-second rule to actually turn it on. So let's go back to you being selfish, okay? I want you to hold on to this idea of what do you want, what do you want in your life? What are your dreams for you? And then I want you to bring it back to yourself. Think about that excuse, that excuse that is stopping you, the one that you always reach for, like I was reaching for the snooze alarm. And I want you to think to yourself, what do you need to change? And it could be something good. Like, I have this huge thing going on in my life right now. I have a brand new, you guys, I landed a daytime syndicated talk show. No kidding. September 16th, I hope you'll tune in five days a week. Watch out, Dr. Phil, because the Mel Robbins Show is going to be airing nationwide. That's right. And when I think about all the changes I've made in the last 10 years, my God, I'm exhausted. And when I think about what it's going to take for me to be successful in this next stage of my life, right? That's right, I hear you. And to do 175 shows a year, and to be a lifeline for people every day, and what it's gonna take for me and my habits. I got a lot I need to change. I need to be more deliberate about a lot of things. I gotta be more present with my family when I'm around them. I gotta make sure that I stay centered and so I want you to think about, when you think about that next chapter that can start right now, what is it that you need to change for the good? That small little tweak, and I want you to hold on to that because this is an easy question to answer. The real one is this one. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. Finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. There's only one sensible thing to do with this empty existence, and that is, fill it. Live long and prosper. Make somebody to look up to. The most important word in that sentence is will. Not will you or won't you change, but do you have the will to push yourself to change? when you're tired, when you're frustrated, when somebody said something just nasty or racist or sexist to you and it brought you down, do you have the will to keep pushing forward? And the answer is, yep, you will, because you're gonna have this puppy in your back pocket, okay? So let me explain how you use it. The next time you're in a situation where that alarm goes off, you kind of know what to do. You feel that little bit of confidence. You feel that hope. You feel that courage coming up. And then you feel that five-second window of hesitation open up, and those excuses roll in, and you start to feel yourself shrinking. You start to feel yourself getting silent. You start to feel yourself backing away from that thing you know you need to do. You're going to pull out the five-second rule and go five, four, three, two, one, and step forward. Now, a couple things about that. If you are with a group of people, do not count out loud because you will sound like a weirdo. I do not want you in a meeting going, five, four, three, two, one! You're like, oh my God, what is happening over there? A couple other things, don't count up. One, two, three, four, five, it doesn't work. The reason why one, two, three, four, five doesn't work is because you and I were taught to count up in whatever language we were to taught to count it in since we were yay high. It's already a pattern 
that is stored right here that you can do on autopilot. You can do it without thinking. I want you to develop a new pattern when you go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and you activate this puppy right here. Let me show you what's actually happening in your brain when you use forms of metacognition. Now, metacognition is just a fancy word that means brain trick. That's all. You have the ability to outsmart your own mind. You have the ability to use simple tricks to be able to control which part of the brain that you're using. So this guy right here is a simulation of a functional MRI when people are using forms of metacognition. That red part right there, it's the interior part of your brain. It's where all your habits are. It's where your emotions are stored. It's where every pattern that you know from driving a car to doubting yourself to feeling anxious, to worrying about what other people think, those patterns that are sabotaging you right there in the red part. The green part, that's your prefrontal cortex. That's gonna make you more money. That's gonna make you happier. That's gonna allow you to develop new skills. That's what you're using when you're in control of what you're doing. So let's count out loud backwards together and let's see what happens when you use this. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Excellent. For those of you that felt pressure right there, don't worry, I'm not a hypnotist. That's just evidence, and you're going to feel that from time to time, that you're actually shifting gears in terms of which part of the mind that you're using. You know, when you first start using this, I think it's really obvious how you use it. You use it to do very irritating things, okay? You're going to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, push yourself to the gym. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, push yourself to talk about total life changes. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, push yourself to put down the drink. Five, four, three, two, one, push yourself to lower your voice. And look, you're probably going to hate me at times. I'm cool with that if you're changing your life for the better. I don't mind if you hate me. And I want to say something else about changing your life for the better. Do you realize I have been using the five-second rule for 10 years? I use it every single morning to get out of bed. I hate getting out of bed. I use it every day to exercise. I hate exercising. I want you to understand something. There are going to be things that you need to do to heal your family, to build your business, to make more money that you may never like. That's OK. You can still do it. So I don't want you to expect that you're ever going to love having to make a cold call. You may always hate it, but you can still do it. I think about it like loading the dishwasher. I hate doing that too, but I still do it. Now I want to show you, given that I think the physical stuff is obvious, I want to show you two really important things. First of all, I'm going to show you a bunch of five-second habits. These are habits that I have that I do every single morning and every single night, and it is the reason why I am so successful. And it is the reason why I can focus on what's important most of the time and not get caught up in the baloney, okay? And so most of you are going to hate these. I want you to try them anyway. And so these are my five second habits that I want you all to adopt. And I promise you, if you adopt these, play around with them, you will make more money. You will make more money in less time. You will feel less anxiety. You will be less distracted. And I promise you, you're going to hate every one of them. You ready? Here we go. So the first one is about your phone. I want to put something into perspective for you. We live in what I call the attention economy, OK? That means your attention is for sale. Whenever you're on Facebook, whenever you're on social media, and you're just kind of wasting time scrolling, if you click on something, you just made somebody money. They just bought your attention. And so one of the things I want to shift your perspective about is it's become more important than ever that you realize that your phone is perhaps the most important tool in your business, right? You got that? For those of you that don't have enough time, the reason why you don't has to do with how much time you waste on this. And so, yeah, I know, mm, I don't like what she's talking about. I don't like this at all. It's true. If you want to, I want you to wake up and realize how often you're really using this to further your business and your goals. 
or when you're the one that's making other people money because you're spending all your time clicking on a bunch of crap that doesn't matter. All right? So one of the number one rules that I have that I want you to adopt, and it takes five seconds, I don't want you to ever have your phone in your bedroom. What? What? How dare you? Excuse me? I do not want your phone in your bedroom. And there's a couple reasons why. Number one, you're addicted to it. OK? Number two, this is sickening. You ready? 33% of you are checking email in the middle of the night. Look, I'm 50 years old. I get up at 2.13 every morning, you know, and I got to go to the bathroom, and it's nice to have a flashlight. But if you got it, then you're going to look at it. This is sick. And most of you don't even realize that you're doing it. And then you wonder, I don't I'm getting, I'm getting to sleep. I can't sleep. <laughs> you want to know the other thing that's sick? 87% of you check it before you brush your teeth. You want to know why you wake up anxious and out of control and you got no time and you're freaked out? It's because you look at this thing before you even get out of bed. I mean, think about it. You're like sleeping. If it's next to you and the alarm goes off, what are you going to do? Oh my god. That's what's going on today in the news? Oh my god, what's happened? That person's on vacation again? I hate them. And you wake up and you're like totally freaked out and upset and oh, now you don't know why you don't know how. And that's why your day starts. Is it any wonder if that's how your day starts, why you don't have time? Why your mind is already out of your control? You have to put this out of your bedroom, and here's why. I don't trust you, and you shouldn't trust you either with it. <laughs> now, here's the second rule. So it's not in your bedroom, so the alarm goes off. I don't want you to hit the snooze button. Now, here's why. The reason why has to do with the way your brain works. Your productivity and your focus has nothing to do with when you get up. It has everything to do with how you get up. So if you, you and I, we sleep in sleep cycles. So you fall asleep, it takes you know, a little while, and then you drift into a sleep cycle, and a sleep cycle is about 75 to 90 minutes. And then you do another one, 75 to 90 minutes. And then you do another one, 75 to 90 minutes. And then your brain goes into a phase where it starts to thaw like a giant chicken, you know, to come awake. And when the alarm goes off, great, get up, you're in the thaw zone. Your brain is ready to start the day. If you hit the snooze button, like I used to hit the snooze button, and then you drift back to sleep, what do you suppose your mind drifts into? Sleep cycle. How long do those take? 75, yeah, 75 to 90 minutes. So when that alarm goes off 15 minutes later and you wake up, your brain is now trapped in a sleep cycle. Sleep researchers, psychologists, neurologists, they call it sleep inertia. If your brain is in a sleep cycle, it impairs your ability to process, to focus, to remember for four hours. So those of you that keep hitting the snooze button and then you spend the day going, oh my god, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Whoa, I feel so groggy. It's nothing to do with how much sleep you got. It has to do with the fact that you screwed yourself over. You basically put yourself back in a sleep cycle and then made yourself wake up and now you're walking around like the walking dead for four hours. So no snooze button. Not because it's enjoyable, but because that's what your brain needs, and that's what your business needs, and that's what you need in order to focus. Now, what do I want you to do? I want you to do something called 30 before 7.30. That means take 30 minutes. If you can't find 30 minutes, take five. What do you not see in this photo? Her phone. That's right. What are you doing during this time? So you've gotten, so the alarm went off. The phone wasn't there, so you didn't look at it. You had to get out of bed because you didn't hit the snooze button. You now find 5 to 30 minutes. I started calling this 30 before 7.30 because my first kid um, got on the bus at uh, 7 o'clock, so that was the first 30 minutes that I could find in the day where things weren't crazy. You know what I'm saying? 
And so this is what mine looks like. No makeup, pajamas, and no phone. Now, what are you doing in those five to 30 minutes? You haven't looked at your phone yet, so you haven't let the craziness of the world into your mind. You have not been hijacked by the attention economy. You've woken up and your brain is ready to go. All I want you to do is I want you to just think about your day. Just think about your day. And here's something that I stole from the folks at Harvard Business School that has changed how I do my day. And that is, all I want you to do is figure out today what is one thing that I want to work on and one way that I can make progress. That's it. So you're going to wake up, not have your phone. You're going to sit down with a cup of coffee or tea, a glass of water, or whatever. You're going to find five to 30 minutes before you turn on the TV or turn on the radio or look at the social media. And you're going to ask yourself, what's the one thing I want to work on today? And what's one little puny thing that I can do to inch that thing forward? Can I send an email? Can I watch a video? Can I go through my social media and unfollow people that trigger me? Can I, um, you know, can I make a phone call? Can I read some of the latest training from Total Life Changes? Yeah, what can I do? What's one thing? That's all I want you to do every day, because if you just did one thing every day to inch this business forward for you, you would be shocked where you are a year from now. And I'm going to tell you, it begins and ends with you giving yourself the key time before the day starts. Don't your dreams deserve 30 lousy minutes? Doesn't your mental health deserve 30 lousy minutes? And you're not going to get it the rest of the day. You're just not. And so this has really changed my life. And so what do I do? The last thing I do at the end of the day, I charge my phone in the kitchen at night. That's what I do. That's what I do with our kids' phones, too. They stay in the kitchen or in the closet somewhere away. That's the last thing I do so that when I go into my bedroom, it's not there. I'm not even tempted. Those are five second habits that will fundamentally change your mindset. It'll change your sense of control. It will give you the little momentum every morning. And every single one of you can five five minutes in the morning. Every single one of you can charge the phone in the kitchen. And by the way, if you want to see a video where I explain this for free, I'm not selling you anything. We just get a lot of questions about this. You can just go to melrobbins.com slash free gift. It's a video explaining the science of all of this in even greater depth. And that's, uh, that's my thank you to you for inviting me here. So if this makes you nervous, good. That's right, good. Because you know what? Nerves are normal. Nerves are important. If you're not doing something once a week that makes you nervous, you should be. Because it means you're not doing anything new, you know? This is part of changing. And so now that I've given you the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, you know how to push yourself, you know how to coach yourself, you know how to beat all the excuses, you know how to close the gap between thinking and doing, you know how to close the gap between doubting yourself and acting with confidence, you know how to close the gap between fear stopping you and being a little courageous. Now I want to give you a couple really cool tricks around dealing with nerves. Because now that you're going to push yourself, you're going to find yourself in situations that make you nervous. Awesome. I want you nervous at least once a week. I want you out on the edge. I want you feeling like, oh my gosh, can I do this? Can I do this? Well, we're going we're gonna to push you to do it. And so it's a medical fact that there's no difference in your body medically when you're in a situation that makes you nervous and a situation that makes you excited. No difference. Like, think about it. In a moment where you're really excited, your stomach has butterflies, right? Same thing's true when you're nervous. In a moment when you're really excited, your armpits, they sweat like Niagara Falls, right? Same thing when you're nervous. Your heart races, your throat gets tight, your hands get clammy. Medical fact. There is no difference between a situation that makes you nervous. I mean, is she nervous? Or is she excited? Whatever you're thinking, you're right, by the way. Because the, the only thing that's different between a situation that's supposedly making you nervous and excited is what your brain is saying about it. So the folks at Harvard Medical School wondered, geez, I wonder 
Since it's a medical fact that your body is exactly the same when you're nervous as when you're excited, could we trick your brain into thinking you're excited in a moment when you're nervous? The answer is yes, you certainly can. So let me show you the really awesome little trick. Because they tested this at Harvard Medical School, and it was fascinating. Every single student who was taught to, to do what I'm about to teach you before a standardized test performed better, before a track meet ran faster, before a negotiation competition did better. Here's the simple trick. The next time you're in a situation that makes you nervous, you're going to go, Five, four, three, two, one. And then you're going to go, I am so excited to fire this person. No bad joke? OK, well, that situation makes me nervous. Makes me very nervous. I'm so excited to give this presentation. I'm so excited to give this sample out. I am so excited. And something crazy is going to happen. Your body is going to settle. And you are going to perform better even though you feel nervous. And you're going to be shocked, just like Chris was shocked. I used the five second rule before a presentation. I used nervous energy to be excited. It worked. Here's the reason why it works. If you're in a situation that makes you nervous and you allow your thoughts to spiral, your own thoughts make your body state worse. When your body state starts to get even more agitated, cortisol, a stress hormone, hits your brain. When cortisol hits your prefrontal cortex, guess what happens? You can't remember what you prepared. You can't process as quickly. So it's not that your preparation in talking to people about this business wasn't good. It's that you allowed your own nerves to release cortisol, and that stopped you from leveraging what you know. It's absolutely amazing. And you need to know this because you're now going to be in situations, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that really, really, really make you nervous. And that's good. Now you know all you have to do is be like, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And you will be startled by how well it works. Now I want to build on that and talk about anxiety. Okay? And if you have children that struggle with anxiety, First of all, you're not alone. And secondly, I want you to pay attention because the five second rule is a remarkable tool that you can use to help your children with anxiety. Now, we've seen a rise in anxiety with our own kids. I was speaking for a massive audience of pediatricians, and a pediatrician came up to me uh, a couple weeks ago after a speech and said, I'm so glad you're talking about this because you know, a couple years ago, Mel, we would have three or four appointments a week where parents would raise anxiety as like an issue. I have five or six appointments a day where it's the primary thing they're coming in with. And I'm sure if you've seen a rise in your own family and you're worried about it, you know, I want you to know that you're not alone. The other reason why I talk about this is because when I talk about anxiety, it's personal. You know, a lot of people will look at me, particularly on stage or in the videos we put out online, and they're like, oh, Mel. Whatever. She was just born confident and annoying. Annoying, for sure. Just ask my baby brother, Derek. Confident? No way. I think if you could be a baby that worries, that was me. I was the kind of kid that, like, my face would turn bright red when I got called on in class. And when I was in sixth grade, growing up in western Michigan, my parents, they sent me to Girl Scout camp in Pentwater. I was so homesick, they sent me home. I mean, do you know how homesick you need to be for trained adults to be like, uh, you need to leave? This is out of hand. By the time I was 19, it was panic attacks. By the time I was 21, it was full-blown anxiety disorder. And thank God a doctor put me on Zoloft. You know, I took that drug for 25 years. And I had no shame in that. I mean, it was a lifesaver for me. In fact, the only time I, I stopped taking it was when our now 20-year-old daughter was born. And I had such severe postpartum depression, like the really scary kind. I couldn't be left alone with our daughter for eight weeks. So when I talk about how you and I torture ourselves with how we think, I have lived this nightmare. Now, about five years ago, as the five second rule started to spread around the world, and I was like overwhelmed with the stories coming in, something happens to you. When you put something out in the world and it helps people change their lives, I know you feel that in your own business as a life changer, right? Like you feel 
like so humbled. And you also feel a sense of responsibility, don't you? I felt a sense of responsibility to not only be able to explain why is something so simple work and help people, but I also felt a responsibility to take a look in the mirror and deal with my own demons. And so I thought, you know, I wonder if you could use the five second rule to do things other than physical habits. I wonder if you could change mental habits. I wonder if you could change your mindset. I wonder if I could cure myself of anxiety. And the answer is, yep, you sure can. In fact, I've been off meds for five years. I haven't had a panic attack, a bout of anxiety. I don't even worry about anything. So it's amazing. It is liberating. When you, when you embrace the idea, everybody, I want to tell you something. I don't know who trained you to talk the way that you talk to yourself. I don't know who trained you to think you're not worthy or you're not good enough or you're not likable. You're not to blame for that. But you have a responsibility to change how you talk to yourself. And I'm going to show you how you do that using science. Are you ready? It's amazing. And I'm going to use an, I'm going to use an example that many of you may be able to relate to, and that's the fear of flying. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the research you just learned from Harvard Medical School about reframing nerves into excitement. Because remember, nerves and excitement, the same thing. And the danger of allowing yourself to stay worried is that you agitate your body further. Believe it or not, there's a really tight connection between worry and anxiety. Worry is your thoughts being negative. Anxiety is when your thoughts get so negative, your body starts to get worried, OK? That's like the little sister and the big sister. A panic attack is when your body becomes so agitated that it's like, oh my god, I think I'm going to die, and it takes over. It's like the mother, OK? So I'm going to use this example to break apart how we think and to show you how to use the I'm excited trick from Harvard Medical School along with something that we call an anchor thought that will anchor your thoughts down and retrain your brain. So the fear of flying. I used to be a real nervous flyer, meaning I was a real weirdo. I would get to the airport. Like, I'm going to go to the airport tonight for my flight at 6.30. And I would get to the gate, and I'd be looking around at the gate area. And I had this whole thing where I wanted to see three kinds of passengers, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see a baby. We got a baby. Yes. I want to see someone in a wheelchair. Awesome. And I'd like to see men and women in the service. Because if those folks are getting on my plane, I could say, all right. God's not going to let this plane go down if they're on it, so it's safe to board, you know what I mean? And then um, I would get to the, uh, the, the, the seat, and I would click that buckle, and the nerves would kick in, and the stomach would be in knots, and the armpits would be sweating like Niagara Falls, and my hands would get clammy, and start drinking water. And, and if you were next to me as I started my breathing, you would literally be like, why me? Why me next to this freak? And so I would try to keep it together as the plane is taxiing. And then the plane would take off. And as it takes off, it's like, OK, it's going up, it's going up. And then you know how the plane takes off, and then it levels off, and it goes from like to And it feels like it's about to fall out of the sky. At that point, all bets are off. I start having a panic attack. I've grabbed you. I'm hyperventilating. I pull out my phone, and I text Chris and our three children, Mommy loves you. Heart emoji. Heart emoji. Because if this plane is about to crash, I want my kids to know I tried to be the best mother that I could. And that way, at my funeral, when they deliver my eulogy, they can put those text messages in the PowerPoint, you know? <laughs> and they can show you. And you giggle, because we're sick. We're sick human beings. If I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast the garbage you say to yourself, you wouldn't be here with us in Dallas. You'd be in an institution. But you listen to it. You listen to it. You listen to it. Oh my god. Why do you listen to this? It's insane. You get an email from your boss. You're like, I'm fired. You know, you get an email from somebody in corporate. What did I do? You have to stop it. 
It is a habit. It's a pattern. That's all it is. And you can break it. And you can replace it. And if you use the five-second rule for nothing else, please go to war against how you talk to yourself. It will not make you more money to keep saying this crap to yourself. You are worthy. You do deserve it. You are smart enough. You work hard. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of success. Period. End of story. Yes, you are. So here's how you do it. When I get on the plane, before I get on that plane, so before you go through your day, I know exactly what triggers me on the plane. It's when we hit turbulence. There's something about that metal tube bouncing around at 30,000 feet in the air that makes me a little nervous, you know what I mean? So I come up with an anchor thought. An anchor thought is any thought related to what you're about to do that excites you. So if you're nervous about sharing total life changes, come up with an anchor thought that makes you excited. Think about what you love about this stuff. Think about the fact that you're going to give people a gift. It's a free sample for crying out loud. Think about the impact this has made on your life. That's your anchor thought. If you have kids that struggle with anxiety, go through their day and talk about everything that makes them nervous and help them come up with another thought that could make them excited about what's going to happen. So I always think, if I'm flying back to Boston, I always think about, okay, what am I excited to do when I get home? Well, I'm excited to walk in the front door because we have a crazy 14-year-old son that always has some kind of wacko greeting, and I love it. And so when I get on the plane tonight, and we fly back east, and we bounce around over the rainstorms that hit the plains today. And my mind goes, oh my god, oh my god. Five, four, three, two, one. I am not thinking about that. I am interrupting that thought. I am yanking my thoughts forward to here. And I am dropping in an anchor thought. I am so excited to walk in the front door and see what he does tonight. Huh? Right? And so what happens? Nothing. It's amazing. What happens is I yank my thoughts to my, for, my prefrontal cortex, and because I'm now thinking about something that's related, my mind's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. She's not nervous about dying. She's excited to get home. That's it. So when you start to feel the butterflies coming, they're going to come. That's cool. You're stepping out of your comfort zone. I love that. Yay, you. Grow, do it. Then go, I'm so excited to make a difference. I'm so excited to have a team of people. I am so excited to change my own life. I am so excited to give this gift and share this sample. I am so excited to have this conversation and remove the garbage that is between me and my dad or my mom or my spouse or my kid. And that anchor thought will anchor you down. And what's amazing, we had somebody write to us, you guys. I'm so proud of this. We had somebody write to us two weeks ago that follows us online, l learned this by just watching some videos that we put out, and she said her six-year-old was so overwhelmed with anxiety, she was getting physically ill before school, throwing up, that anxious, working herself into a tizzy. And she started using this simple formula I've just given to you. Go through your day. She's like, well, what are you worried about in the first period? What are you worried about in the second period? Okay, well, what can we think about that would be exciting? And what could you think about if you have to go to the nerf? And what could you... Do you know in two days, two days, using just the five-second rule, I'm excited and anchor thoughts, this little girl is no longer getting sick and, in fact, was bounding out of the car going, I am so excited, so excited. This stuff works, but it doesn't work if you don't use it. So if you don't think you have anxiety, I think you're wrong. I think we all do. Um, I love this email from Muhammad. Thank you, Mel. I had an important email to send, but I was afraid. How many of us have a, an email or a phone call, right? We're thinking about it. We're afraid. Why are we afraid? Because we're uncertain. That's all that, that triggers us. We're uncertain about how it's going to go. Do you know that thinking about it doesn't create certainty? 
The only thing that will give you certainty is you taking control in that five second window, changing how you think and taking control of what you do in response. And I'm telling you, the secret is just five seconds. That's it. You, just, you don't have to worry about the big stuff. You've got to worry about these five second windows. You've got to worry about whether or not you got the clarity and the courage to hear the alarm and the power and the genius that is inside of you. And you know, you can get resigned. I was resigned. I didn't think how on earth could simply getting my butt out of bed, how could that make a difference when our problems are so big? I'm telling you, you change your life one decision at a time. In fact, I think you're just one decision away from a totally different life. You're one decision away from not torturing yourself upstairs. It's the big stuff that you change with the littlest moments. Just ask Brittany and Todd. So today's Brittany's wedding day, and what you can't tell is it's been a terrible decade for the family because Brittany and Todd's mom got a divorce, and what are the rules of the divorce? Oh, you hate each other, and you fight like cats and dogs, you hire lawyers, and spend all your money, and you lose everything, and finally the dust settles, and the divorce is final, and then what happens? Oh, everybody remarries, and it's like a big team sport of hate again. So. You know, he's walking his new wife up the aisle, and that alarm goes off. That alarm that's inside of you, that is trying to signal you to pay attention that there's magic here, there's connection here, there's change here, there's power here. That alarm goes off, and it says, dude, you got to do something to heal this family. He sets his new wife down. He makes a five-second decision. There were a million reasons not to do what he did. But he turned around, he walked back, he grabbed this man. That's a man he hates, that's Brittany's stepdad. Just look at the lady next to them for crying out loud, you guys. <laughs> and invited him to walk their daughter down the aisle. One decision changes everything. Just ask his family. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.